Thank you. 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 Give us a minute. <laughs> I need a clicker. All right. Yeah, All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited that so many people came to the lecture on the valuation of bonds using the effective yield method. <laughs> no, wrong room. Are you in the right classroom? No, I'm just kidding. This story is personal. It has nothing to do with my career, or maybe it has everything to do with my career. I don't know. You decide. But I've been waiting to tell this story for over 20 years, so thank you guys for letting me. Um, yeah, she made me like on the verge of tears already, so I'm going to just probably <laughs> sob through the whole thing. Uh, but I have to tell you about the first year. You probably hear a little accent, so I have to you know, explain myself here. Um, I'm going to tell you about the first year in the United States and uh, the people I met, the people who took care of me, the people who invested in me, and um, you know how it changed who I am, who my children are. Um, wow. <laughs> um, and uh, the things they taught me. All right. So, but now you have to know where I'm from. So I'm going to just show you a little picture that describes my childhood and adolescence. <laughs> this is not the wartime photo from the Eastern Front. <laughs> this is me and my college buddies in November of 1990 in the mandatory labor camp for students in the Soviet Union. You see the Soviet Union, when the collective farms needed help with harvest, the state, because state owns everything, <laughs> they would send the soldiers, the military, and the students to help out. So here we are. We were there for two weeks. But don't worry. It's not as bad as it sounds. We had a good time. You have to pull carrots and beets out of the ground only eight hours a day. <laughs> and the rest of it, you kind of like hang out with your friends. And you bond over singing the guitar to the guitar. And you know, drinking the cheap booze. And living in the barracks, 16 people to a room. And, you know, getting paid in cigarettes. They paid us in cigarettes. Good time. <laughs> My childhood and adolescence of the Soviet Union like, is its own show that probably requires hours. So I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to show you the first picture that I took when I arrived into the United States. And my colors changed literally and figuratively. This is the first photo. This is August 1992. I saw this guy. This is a dog show. I don't know. People took me there. And I saw this guy who looked like every character who stepped out of every movie about America. I had to take a picture with him. Do you see how excited I am? I, I, like, this is 26 years later, and I still carry the sense of awe and giddiness and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed kind of sense with me uh, ever since that, uh, that month. But I came to the United States as a foreign exchange student to Berkshire Community College. I don't know if you know the Berkshires in the Massachusetts, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And because they don't have a dorm, they found a host family for me. Don and Marion, we called her Mary Lathrop. So I lived in this room at the end of their hallway. And they fed me, and they clothed me, and they gave me rides because, you know, you have to drive everywhere. What the heck? I grew up in the city. I didn't have driver's license even. They, celebra uh, they helped me celebrate my 26th birthday by making me this adorable C poster, happy birthday to Anna. <laughs> they gave me like a pile of gifts. Toothbrush was part of it. It was just, it was great. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Toothpaste! <laughs> Speaking of packaging, you know, it's just like the box fascinated me. Um, <laughs> So as such, I was blessed with two sets of parents. 
So here they are. I had two biological ones and then two unofficially adopted ones because Don and Mary became my American parents. They still are. This is all four of them in 94 when my parents came to visit. I will let you guess which ones are my biological. <laughs> Do you need a clue? It's not the tall ones. <laughs> so Don and Mary took, not only took care of me, like in the way that you take care of the children, and they introduced me to such miracles that you have here as orange juice and peanut butter. <laughs> But they also had the biggest influence on my emotional development, on my internal growth, on my set of values, evolution, because they showed me what it looks like to live your values, what it looks like to stay in your integrity on a daily basis. I did not know how it's done, and they were the ones who showed me. They, in a sense, they took care of you know, the bottom three layers of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs for me, so I could dream and I could start thinking bigger. You know, the, for those who don't know, the, the bottom line is like shelter and food. Yes, check. And second one, physical safety, check. And third one is belonging. You know, they took me in like I was their own daughter. Check. So I could move up that pyramid. And don't get me wrong, I didn't come from the slums. <laughs> My parents are both college professors, and I, I had all the basics in, in Russia, even mandatory labor camps, you know, <laughs> as a bonus. But you know, my, unlike my parents' childhood who grew up during the war, my childhood was so much more abundant. They were hungry most of their childhood. I was never hungry. You know, I, I got into one of the prestigious universities in Moscow, and it was free. You know, the education is free. The health care is free. We all get five weeks of vacation. We get a year of maternity leave paid, you know, so good stuff. But you guys have something we don't. Merchandise. <laughs> Access merchandise. I still remember stepping in to Big Y, this miracle place in Pittsfield and being just awed by the variety of cheeses. <laughs> Who needs so much cheese? <laughs> I remember being stopped in my tracks at CVS. I didn't know it was called CVS. It was just Miracle Store that had an aisle after aisle of greeting cards that are written in. You don't even have to come up with your own words. <laughs> you know, compare that to me, like you have to go to the post office and then there is two choices, roses or tulips, right? Donata, Donata grew up in the Soviet Union, she knows. Roses or tulips, and then you have to provide your own text. You actually have to write in whether it's a birthday or a funeral. So, <laughs> another difference was in the education system, and I did not realize it until I came here. In America, not only you don't have education for free for some reason, but you also have different uh, degrees. There is an associate degree, there is a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and then there is doctorate degree. And in Russia, we have just two degrees. So there is a degree that's called higher education degree, and it uh, takes five years. And then there is a doctorate, only two. So by then, by the time I came here, I already had four years of <laughs> student labor camps. Uh, the education, I mean. Um, <laughs> so four years of college were done. And then I come here and I realized that community college means you get an associate's degree. So with 
Don and Mary's blessing, because that would mean that instead of one semester, they would have to feed me for a whole year. But they encouraged me, they supported me. I went to the president of the community college, Berkshire Community College, and I said, if you leave me here for another semester and transfer some of my credits, I took four years of credits by then. The history of Communist Party must count for something. <laughs> actually counted as history. I love it. I got a credit for it. Um, I would get an associate's degree. So when I go back to Russia, I would, you know, nobody knows it's a college, associate's degree. They just have an American degree. You know, I would be so much more marketable because uh, Russia just went into this market economy. And now all of a sudden, instead of state giving us the jobs after graduation, we have to find our own jobs. Everybody was in panic. That was, so I needed to be kind of more marketable that way. And the president of Berkshire Community College, Dr. Catherine Addy, changed my life by allowing me to stay that second semester and get my associate's degree. And here we are, 1993. Aww. After five years of school, I'm getting my associate's degree full time, right? And there's uh, Professor Addy. She actually waived some of the tuition because I have to tell you, I came with $200 that my brother and my father scraped up their life savings to send me here. And as you can see, I'm holding um, flowers and I'm looking off camera. I'm actually looking at a civil engineering student that I started dating during that second <laughs> semester. <laughs> And I would marry that boy the next day. And, and uh, the next year, we would transfer to UMass Amherst, where we would get our bachelor's degree. We would start our careers. We would have a beautiful baby girl, Victoria, who is 20 now. Uh, and at this point, I just have to pause here and say, Stephen, you are my second and favorite husband. <laughs> You know, I have to provide context. <laughs> and we have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, during that year of living with Don and Mary, what I learned is that I was not the first person to live in that room, and I was not the last person to live in that room. So, over their marriage since 1956, they continuously took care of somebody other than two biological sons and their adopted daughter. There was always somebody living in their house and they were taking care of somebody. And I kind of did the count because I, I count things <laughs> compulsively. <laughs> there was over 20 people, but I wanted to introduce you to some of them. So there was Tom from UK. They met him while biking through Europe in the 60s. I guess that's what people did. <laughs> uh, they, he came here. He lived with them for two years. And he's actually retired now after a career of being a principal at middle school. So he kind of he took what they invested in him and gave it to the kids throughout his life. Then uh, there was Debbie from Vermont. I'm not showing the picture to protect her anonymity because she was a pregnant girl who was kicked out of her house and out of her town, essentially, by her mother uh, to hide her teen pregnancy. She stayed with Don and Mary until she was able, you know, until she had the baby and was able to put her up for adoption. And then she, shortly after that, she moved to uh, New Mexico. That story doesn't end there because uh, 20 years later, Mary received a phone call from a young woman because Mary's address was listed as the last known address for her birth mother on the adoption uh, papers. So they were able to reunite uh, the birth mother and the birth daughter. So they were part of these heartfelt stories as a result of them hosting these people. And then there was Yoko from Japan. She lived with them for two years, and they did amazing work together. The three of them started what was called a Never Again campaign that would bring volunteers from Japan to talk to the US audiences about the devastating effects of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
over those years, it, that work, that project to Don and Mary to Japan over a dozen of times, they created a whole community. They w brought over 60 volunteers to the United States to give over 12,000 talks. So this was amazing. Then there was Bobo from Burma, now <laughs> Myanmar. Bobo was a political prisoner for four years in his co home country before he stayed with Don and Mary. Staying with them provided him an opportunity to take classes, to get his education going. Here he is two years, late, uh, two years ago getting his doctorate from London School of Economics. And he moved back to his family because the regime changed and he was able to return. And he works there now. This story might make me cry again. Um, so while volunteering for alternative to violence workshops in upstate prison, upstate New York prison, Don and Mary befriended one of the participants. They introduced him to us as city to protect again his anonymity. And he was from New York City. And he got attached to them so closely that I heard him call Mary mother although they were almost the same age. So no surprise, they were the two to pick him up from the gates of the prison on his first day. That's his first picture after 20 years, 28 years in prison. He spent it with them in that room. Then there was this kid, he's my kind of closest roommate, brother through the generations, Churchill from Ghana. He stayed in that room right before I stayed in that room. He had the same accounting professor at Berkshire Community College and as I did, and he's a CPA too. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what Bill Mulholland, the accounting professor, did to us. Um, and I just heard that Bill Mulholland became a preacher, so I'm not sure what you know, Churchill and I are going to do after we are done with the CPA. <laughs> then these two cats appeared. <laughs> so this is, you know, I already told you, I was a planned visit. And then I found Eula in the hallways of Berkshire Community College. And when you hear somebody speaking your language, you kind of become <laughs> very fast friends. So I learned that Eula came here as an au pair. And the family that she was working for were taking total advantage of her. So I begged Don and Mary to take her in until we find a more suitable home for her. So she lived with us for several weeks as well. And we're still good friends. After us, and I think the latest house guest is Adam. And I, by the way, I ask permission to show all these photos too. Uh, Adam, um, Adam's family was homeless in Boston. He actually lived in the tiny motel room with his mother and a sister. So Don and Mary, because he was a teenager and he was growing up, they gave him that room to kind of find himself, to be able to finish high school and to take some classes. And the latest I heard that in November, he became a U.S. Marine. So he kind of got, uh, got his life on track. So all of us, gather at Don and Mary's, or whoever we can, whoever's in the country, we go back, and it's a crappy photo, but it's such a good photo, too. <laughs> because, you know, city is there. We get to know each other. It's a reunion for all of those people who ever started with Don and Mary and consider them our sole parents. So only one person in this picture is actually biologically <laughs> related to them. That's their tall son, Scott, right there. <laughs> So we get to know each other. We created this family slash community just by staying with Don and Mary. But it, that wasn't the only thing they did. Besides taking care of somebody always in their home, they also did a lot of other active peace work and social justice work. It started with them going to none other than 1963, March on Washington, for jobs and freedom. Do you remember that one? They were a young couple that got to hear Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream, in person. 
Subsequently, they just got involved and they went to every peace march, every environmental march, wherever they could show up for the cause they believed in, that's when they showed up. They, they went back to the 25th year anniversary of that march, to 50th anniversary of that march. It was a big deal because Berkshire Eagle put, uh, made an article about them. And uh, they were able to bring the next generation. J uh, Churchill and his kids joined him uh, at that march. So their influence started rippling through the generations as well. So it was no wonder when I finally, after 20 years of trying to make money and not go homeless, I was ready to march. And I think my boiling point came in 2016 when I heard of the Women's March that is getting organized in Washington. And they were the first people I called. They said, Don, this time I'm going to go with you. I can go. Are you going? And that's when Don said, you know, this might be the first march we don't attend because that eight hour bus ride to Washington is really hard on our aging backs. By then they were already in their 80s. So I said, all right, then I'm going to go. And I grabbed my daughter, Victoria, and I, and I hooked up with Eula, who is at this point a professor at Georgetown University. And she brought her teenage daughter, and the four of us went and attended the first <coughs> women's march, which was amazing. And I kind of, not only it affected us, but it affected our daughters as well. And then I started joining every social justice committee that I could find. <laughs> there was. Uh, March for Our Lives in Boston. I brought my son to Sash, say hi, yeah. <laughs> this is us at Women's March. This is our gay pride parade in Worcester, where I lived at the time, and uh, my social justice committee made a, presenta uh, made a representation there. And then, once I started becoming more financially stable, I knew that it was my turn now to open up my home to somebody. So over the years, we, uh, my family hosted a few people, not as many as Don and Mary, I'm still working on it. But, you know, we hosted uh, MD from Russia, doctor, uh, her name is Lubov. We hosted a teenager from France, we took her everywhere, New York City and everywhere, fellow men. And j after we moved to Portsmouth, just last summer, I sailed the student, uh, music student from Kazakhstan, stayed with us all summer. And we were able to connect her with PMAC Community Band. So you might have seen her playing clarinet during their, uh, you know, during their um, performances. And then somehow I went from attending the first women's march to organizing the latest one, the fourth one in Portsmouth. I don't know, maybe some of you have been there. My daughter came up to support me too, and the most, thing, most exciting thing for her was John Cusack's appearance there. <laughs> so, not a Thanksgiving, not a birthday goes by when I don't express my gratitude and my love to Don and Mary because I stayed in touch with them, I visit them once or twice a year. They're truly like my you know, parents. But there was one person in the story that I had to wait to thank. I don't know if you remember the president of that community college, <clears throat> Dr. Catherine Addy. She left co that community college the same year I did. She moved to Connecticut. She was a president of a different community college down in Connecticut. And then she retired. So I lost track of her. So imagine my surprise when I learn that the newly appointed president of your own Great Bay Community College in Portsmouth is none other than Dr. Catherine Addy. <laughs> I have to tell you, all roads lead to Portsmouth. <laughs> I was able to meet her at a fundraising event for that college. And I was able to tell her 
how her one decision changed my life. So here we are, 26 years later. She could, couldn't be here because she's at the legislative breakfast asking for funding, whatever. <laughs> Community colleges, they re rely on funding. But coincidentally, I just started teaching a co course at Great Bay Community College, and I took a picture of them last week. Here they are. You know, th they're taking a quiz on valuation of uh, bonds. See how exciting that is? <laughs> But what's amazing is that out of 12 kids in my class, we have five continents represented. That's Great Bay Community College. Five. There's a girl from Colombia. That's South America. There is, there is a guy from Zimbabwe. That's Africa. There is me and another guy from Spain. We cover Europe. There are three people from Indonesia. That's Asia. And then there are a couple of people all the way from Rochester, New Hampshire. <laughs> that covers North America right there. <laughs> Exotic. Uh, it's very meaningful and profound work for me to be able to pay forward the investment that was given into me. This, it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to do that. So what I wanted to leave you with is that you might have to wait 26 years to get your thank you from somebody. After a life of peace and social justice work, you might get a peace poll dedicated to you at your place of employment. Aww. You might not. <laughs> Don't count on that. <laughs> but whatever it is that you do, and however you invest in humans and humanity, whether it's adopting a child, fostering a child, teaching a child, giving somebody a ride, hosting a foreign exchange student, please know that your investment in humanity grows human dividends. And they span continents, and they span generations. <laughs> wow, I didn't want to start. <laughs> it's in a you know, uplifting note, really. <laughs> so you will be creating a living legacy, and you will be affecting much more than just one small world. Because, you know, they did this for me, and now all of you know their, their story. So if you are very lucky, you might get Creative Mornings Talk dedicated to you someday. 